Okay, Council, I'm going to call the uh, public hearing of Tuesday, February 25th to order. And can we have the roll call, please, uh, Clerk? Yes. Mayor, Mayor Stewart in the chair, Councillor Carr, Councillor DiGenova, not in the chamber, Councillor Fry, not in the chamber, Councillor Swanson, Councillor Hardwick, Councillor Weeb, Councillor Boyle, Councillor Dominato, not in the chamber, Councillor Blyes on leave of absence, <clears throat> and Councillor Kirby Young. You have quorum. Thank you. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge we're in the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Sabletooth, and thank for them for having care for these lands for millennia and enjoying working with them as partners as we move forward to building this great city together. I want to thank all the staff who do an awesome job every day, and uh, thanks so much for that. Um, just to remind folks that are attending today, uh, about the uh, conduct in the public gallery. So I'd like you to uh, refrain from addressing council members without permission or applauding or otherwise interrupting council member or speaking speakers addressing council. And if you could respect my direction as chair so that we can create a respectful environment for council, the public and staff at today's meetings. Uh, just so everyone knows, speakers have five minutes to make their comments and should limit their comments to the merits of the report being considered and state whether you oppose or support the report, uh, the recommendations. You may only speak once as a speaker and you can follow along at Twitter, uh, on Twitter at uh, Van City Clerk for updates on the progress of the meeting, the meeting so you don't miss your turn to speak. Any comments in the public agenda can be submitted in writing to public hearing at vancouver.ca, public hearing at vancouver.ca. If you're speaking on behalf of a group, you have up to eight minutes to speak, but uh, those folks will also have to be here with you uh, and identified at the meeting, either in person or by a representative of the group, and you can't be a speaker yourself. And if we don't hear from all speakers this evening, we'll recess and reconvene the meeting on Thursday, February 27th at 6 p.m. here in Council Chambers. Uh, just also a reminder that we're a quasi-judicial body, meaning that we only consider the merits of the rezoning application or heritage designation in front of us. Council members may ask clarifying questions from speakers, including the applicant, or technical advice from staff, but should save debate for after the close of speakers. After hearing from speakers, council may approve in principle the application, refuse the application, or defer the application for further consideration. Um, let's see. Before I begin, I'd like to remind Council we need to move the recommendation for Item 1 together with the yellow memorandum dated February 25th entitled Tax Amendment colon Simplified and Expanded Zoning and Development Regulations for Passive House Projects. The memo is intended to provide additional information to Council, but no further action is required. Uh, so now Clerk will read the application and summary of correspondence. This is an application by the General Manager of Planning, Urban Design and Sustainability to amend the zoning and development, development bylaw provisions for certified passive house projects except laneway houses to respond to directives in Vancouver's Climate Emergency Response Report and remove barriers to building to the passive house standard. The following correspondence has been received since referral to public hearing and prior to the close of the speaker's list and receipt of public comments. Four pieces of correspondence in support and four pieces of correspondence in opposition. This represents all correspondence received up to 5 p.m. today. Thanks very much. And we don't have a presentation, uh, but we have uh, Andrea Wickham from the uh, Sustainability Group to answer questions. Or maybe Doug Smith. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, did you want to address us? or? OK, great. So Councillor Swanson, uh, you've got the floor for five minutes. Yeah, I have a question about the yellow memo. When you say the proposed amendments are available only to high performance buildings, what's a high performance building? You just have a problem with the microphone here. Oh, that's what that means. Just one second. I'll just stop your time, Councillor Swanson, while we work on uh, the mics. Don't seem to be working. So it's just have red to wait, now. Councillor. Yeah, no, it's it's actually uh, Sir Smith's mic. Mm. 
maybe to save us some time, I can speak to the question if you'd like, Council. High performance building means ones that are super energy efficient, like Passive House certified, as an example. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I don't see none of these mics seem to be working. Um, clerk's mics are working. Oh, there we go. Okay, perfect. Excellent. Okay, anything else, Councillor Swanson? No. Nope. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Carr. Yes, thank you. Um, I've got a, a number of questions. My first question is, um, uh, when, it, uh, when you use the term passive house standard, um, there's been some confusion on whether that means passive house certified. Um, can you please explain what the difference might be and where do we get the word standard from? Uh, so, uh, to introduce myself, my name is Doug Smith. I'm the Director of Sustainability for the City of Vancouver here. Um, when we say passive house standard as opposed to certified, uh, it, it means that you go through the passive house uh, checklist and there's uh, essentially a spreadsheet that you go through to, to add up a certain amount of points. Uh, the Director of Planning has the ability to figure out, to, to agree on what is an acceptable standard uh, to that level. Passive house certified is a little bit higher than what the passive house standard we would look at. So it's a slightly different standard, but it's essentially a very high performance building. Right. And there are some other Canadian versions of that that also um, meet that standard that we would consider. Right. So um, it is our checklist, the City of Vancouver checklist? Uh, no, it's actually the passive house uh, Enerfit checklist that is done by passive house. Um, and it would just add up to a certain score uh, for that building. Okay. So I've heard that the cost is higher. Um, is, it, is it higher... If you go actually go through certification or no, it's it is slightly higher for certification. Um, it's kind of you think of it like a hockey stick to get that last couple of percent uh, may require some things that we don't feel are absolutely necessary, especially with our energy grid being um, hundred percent or ninety eight percent renewable. That uh, we don't need to meet the same stringent standards as you would find internationally. Right. Okay, a couple of more questions. Um, how many, uh, there's been concern, and we've had, uh, as council, all of us received correspondence from the Character Home Network um, around uh, the impact that this might have on character homes, and uh, because of the, um, in the fair statement, the disadvantage of, um, uh, of uh, retention bonusing for character homes versus for the passive house buildings. So the first thing in the, their correspondence, they talked about the proposal being a 16% increase in FSR for dis detached homes and 18% for duplexes. I'm not reading that in this report. I'm reading it. But so if you could maybe explain that for me. Sure. Um, the actual... <sighs> The, the way this um, program works is when you build to a higher energy, like a passive house standard, you end up with wider walls, uh, you end up with more insulation in the roof, and you end up with uh, more equipment in the building itself, which takes up more space. So the majority of this of, of the existing change that's been in, been in place uh, since 2018 uh, is 12% really associated with that extra space to make sure that the homeowner is uh, made whole. Essentially, they're not being penalized. They're not losing space for building to a higher standard as per the, the city's direction that we want to do. Um, th there's an additional 4% on top of that 12% that we're giving as an incentive. So the actual incentive to the homeowner is really only 4%. Um, the rest yes. is just to not penalize them for, for doing that. And then a duplex uh, gets slightly more incentive on top okay. of that. Okay. And, and is there an incentive for a owner of a character home or a um, heritage home to uh, renovate to a passive house standard? Yes, yes, there is. So um, the existing character home incentive program is 6%. So if you do a renovation to your character home, you can add 6% density to that house. If you also decide to upgrade to a passive house standard and do energy efficiency at the same time, you can, you can stack those two incentives and get an additional 4% on top, which would make a total of a 10%. So there is a, a sort of additional incentive to do both. 
Okay, so um, so that would be uh, a four, compared to the four percent for FSR, it's a ten percent if you retain the home and uh, make it passive. It's in the care, case of a character home. Okay, that is correct. That that's good to know. How about how many properties are are you anticipating being inf affected? And I'm I'm thinking specifically of, of of housing of properties where there are character homes or heritage homes. That's the concern of people who've been writing into us. Um. Based on previous numbers, we would expect one or two homes a year would be impacted out of the 1,400 that are built every year. Uh, we saw about 10 homes per year take advantage of this over the last few years, uh, but only a small percentage, one or, uh, one or two of those homes would have been character homes. Okay. And um, in terms of um, your hope that some of these extra incentives would um, increase the number of applications? Do you have any kind of ballpark of what you're hoping to see in terms of increased numbers of passive homes? We're just at five. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, on to Councillor Hardwick. Hi there. I'm going to carry on um, because I'm, I'm looking at uh, Appendix A, page 2, 10.23A4, uh, which talks about um, excluding 16% of the floor area. Mm -hmm. on a one-family dwelling or a one-family dwelling with a secondary suite. Um, and then I'm, I'm looking at the yellow memo where I see uh, approximately 4% of the building area for a single passive and, less, bo for a, and uh, less the bonus density for a character retention at 6%. I think uh, because we're banding these various numbers around, it really would have been uh, help helpful to chart it out to make it a little bit easier to understand, but could um, I'm still struggling with it. I don't know if you uh, totally got it there, Councillor Carr. Could you lay it out for us again? What's going on here? Sure, absolutely. Um, when you build a high performance house, you need you take up more space for insulation and for equipment. What we used to do over the last couple of years is a homeowner or the builder on behalf of that homeowner would have to fill out a whole bunch of checklists and actually calculate the amount of space that was being lost to building these high performance homes. They would submit that to staff. Staff would then do a detailed review and then say, yes, we will give you 11%, 12%, 13%, depending on that calculation. We realize after two years of this that um, that's kind of a redundant calculation. It's really consistently 12%. So we're just saying, we're gonna give you 12% right out of the box to deal with um, the additional space you need to meet these requirements. On top of that 12%, we're now giving the homeowners an additional 4% as an incentive because they're taking a bit of a risk. They're building a type of house that is relatively new to the market. They're, they're putting in new products, different windows, different uh, equipment in that house. And so it's a bit of an incentive to try to encourage people to do it so the marketplace and the builders themselves can learn about this. So the 12% is fixed based on the building itself and the 4% is the actual incentive. Okay, but still hard to align the yellow memo with um, the main report. Um, the question, uh, here's another question uh, about single family houses. W uh, um, talked about single family houses with, with uh, secondary suites. Would this also apply to duplexes? This would apply for, to duplexes? I'm checking. Yes. And um, we're talking about character houses and heritage in the same breath, but of course they're two distinctly different things, heritage having uh, expressed mer merit and character being uh, just generally described as pre-1940. Mm -hmm. um, don't we have a process already where we evaluate those pre-1940 houses to determine whether they're worth saving? I actually don't know that much about the character house retention program, so I might have to defer that question to... You. Hugh McLean, um, Planning, Urban Design and Sustainability. Yes, there, there is a, a formal review process where we look at character buildings, development planners, uh, not heritage planners, but they go through a process where they have a checklist and they look at a number of components, things like porches, roofing, massing, um, integrity, all those things are taken into consideration as to whether it's a character building or not. Indeed. So there would, uh, when, when someone was determining whether they wanted to develop a passive house, it would make a difference whether it was heritage or whether it was character and whether it was worth preserving in the character category. Uh, yes, I mean, the same outcome would be uh, expected in terms of a character building, in terms of the exterior treatment. Um, it would uh, be the passive treatments, as I understand them, would be interior components. They wouldn't affect how it looked on the exterior. Thank you very much. Um, I think there was, I think that answers my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ishinova. Thanks very much, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, uh, through you to staff, 
I did have a question about accessibility and exemption for accessibility. I didn't really clearly see that in the report. So uh, in understanding that this is how we'd like people to move forward, uh, but it, accessibility is something that we we also consider here at the City of Vancouver. Is that um, is there extra floor space exemption for making something accessible to an adaptability level three or beyond standard? Um, I, Considering the the extra room, you said that, that yeah, it that that was not included in this report. Okay, uh, I'm not aware of a standard that allows that already. No. Okay, so um, could we see an accessible home be built in the passive house guidelines that are here before us today? Yes, you absolutely okay. could see an accessible modifications to a house and still meet uh, pass a passive house guidelines. Okay, and would it be the discretion of the director of planning or would there be a way forward that applicants could, instead of just going one by one, look, ask for those exemptions if they needed wider hallway space, if they needed turning radius. Um, I, I'm aware that Councilor Weeb is the uh, liaison to the Persons with Disabilities Advisory Committee, but being the liaison for uh, a number of years, uh, for six years at Park Board as well, I understand that this is something that, you know, they feel very strongly about. So I was wondering if there was another policy that, that could be applied with this to allow for that. Um, what I would recommend is staff take that back and look at what's currently allowed by, by the Director of Planning and then uh, bring a memo back to Council on, on uh, in, in response to that. Okay, or would that be dealt with in the accessible path work that staff are doing that could be dealt with in passive coming up? is a way to Possibly. not have to make staff bring forward another memo to yeah, if, if it's dealt with within that, we would do that. Great. Thank you very much. Those are my questions. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, so we're getting all these letters saying that this will incentivize the demolition of heritage homes. So can you visualize why people are saying that? Um, I, th I believe that uh, people who have that concern maybe misunderstood the report uh, as far as what's available to pass, uh, what's available to character homes and also what's available to do these incentives. I also uh, feel that, um, and I'm guessing here a little bit of, of what their concerns would be, that maybe they didn't understand the volume or the number of homes that would be impacted, one or two a year perhaps, um, which I don't feel would have a, a material impact on you know, the city's overall character uh, home stock. Um, but isn't the incentive supposed to increase the volume? The incentive is to encourage people who are building a new house already to consider going to a higher standard uh, to make it passive house, which will support the industry and move the whole program forward quicker. So they're building a new house, they're not retaining an old one? You can retain the old house and do the renovation at the same time, or you can build a new house. Okay, thank you. Thanks, and that's it for, oh, Councillor Fry. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Smith. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out the math here. Um, the, so the, for, uh, there's a 12%, okay, so there's a 4% bonus, there's 12% bonus for the actual space to equip the extra thickness of walls and, and that kind of thing, correct? Correct. And then a 4% additional bonus uh, for just going passive house for a total of 16%. Correct. Now, on the on the heritage incentive side, are, am I following it? There's an extra 6% for heritage uh, retention or character home retention? That would be correct. Yeah. On top of the 16, so you're 16. ending up with 24%. That sounds right. Yeah. Yes. Yes? Okay. Or 22. Yeah, sorry. I can't do <laughs> math. Uh, yeah. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Councillor Hardwick, you have a minute and 15 seconds. Yeah, I just had a, a, a little bit left. Again, I want to come back to the difference between heritage and, and uh, character and the, the differentiation between the two. Um, we've seen depletion of character homes, and, and forgive me, but um, certainly on the heritage side, I would like to see no heritage um, buildings uh, deconstructed in connection with passive house because our heritage houses are so special. Um, I take your point, but we've lost so much so many character houses, which is why there's a narrative why there's a 
a group that we're talking to about this. So I just wanted to, to make sure that that has been considered um, because character houses, you can say it's no good, we're not going to save it, but heritage must, there's, there should be no exceptions around heritage. A question? Yes. Is that, am I accurate in my depiction between the two? Heritage, no, no, uh, no deconstruction. Just 10 and seconds. Character, maybe. Um, <clears throat> can I jump in? Just have 10 seconds. Um, yeah, so. This is unrelated to this report. This report is about new construction. The, the ability to demo, uh, demolish uh, a heritage house versus a character is unrelated to what is actually in this, this topic. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay, so that's it for questions. We do have uh, some folks uh, uh, that want to address, uh, speak to this. So we have um, Bryn Davidson from the uh, Lane Fab Design. <clears throat> Thanks so much for coming in. You have up to five minutes. You may have questions from counselors. Hi there, I'm Bryn Davidson. I'm co-owner of Lane Fab. Uh, we design and build custom homes in Vancouver. Um, for the last 10 years, we've been building every single project beyond the code. Um, 10 years ago, we built the first laneway house in the city of Vancouver, and it had 13-inch thick walls and triple glazed windows. And we have done that on every single project since then, um, at our own time and expense, figuring out how to navigate the process of doing that. Um, 10 years ago, we negotiated the first thick wall exclusion so that our green buildings weren't getting penalized on floor area because it was insane that you would try to do a green building and then face a penalty. So we've, we've navigated this increasingly complex and interesting sort of way of trying to make these things possible. Um, and now uh, we're building all passive houses. We're doing all of our single family homes to the passive house standard. And the walls of those projects are 17 inches thick. So your 11 by 17 piece of paper is the thickness of that wall. Um, so, when we put all those incentives and other things together, um, it's great, it gets us there, but it becomes very complicated. So what this motion is doing is taking a whole bunch of existing stuff and bundling it into a very simple package and then putting a little incentive on the end. For 10 years, we've been asking for just the tiniest little bit of incentive because when a client comes through the door, they're already gonna build a house and three quarters of them, I'm introducing the idea of passive house to them. I'm telling them, take your basic house you're going to do anyway, and let's upgrade to passive house. And there's great incentives from zoning and other types of things, but if I can say there's an extra 3 or 4% of floor area, all of a sudden clients say, yes, let's do it. So it's a, little, it's a little bit of thing that can have potentially a really big impact. And so I think this is actually quite profound and really important that we support this initiative. Um, what we do in Vancouver scales up gets read about internationally and gets taken to other cities. So it's not just about a couple of homes. The impact locally is very small, but the idea of this and how that translates into city building um, is really important. So I'm hoping that you can support that. Thanks very much. Uh, I have questions. Councilor Dejanova, up to five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Uh, really appreciate your comments. Wanted to ask you about accessibility, and uh, I'm sure you might have heard my question to staff. But uh, do you feel that if there's another policy that comes after this that addresses accessibility and maybe exemption for uh, a little bit of FSR that might be needed for accessibility, and um, among other things that I that I know that um, perhaps you have already shared input with our staff on? Uh, do you do you think that you know, bundling this up without accessibility will hinder that? Or do you think that multiple policies can be applied to this? I think they can be done separately. I think the accessibility is critical. There's a couple of key things. We could make the buildings a few feet taller and make it so we don't have to have basements. Every single one of these projects could be fully accessible. The only reason our projects aren't accessible is because of the way our zoning is written. So I really hope we address that, but we can do that separate from this motion, which is also very important. Okay, thank you. Another question that I had, and it, it's uh, more to Councillor Hardwick's question um, around heritage, character. I understand the difference, but uh, both in places in Vancouver allow infill um, in, in the form of laneway homes, uh, perhaps, or um, in, in for Shaughnessy, there's the HRA. I'm just wondering, do you, do you feel that this will be helpful at... at Perhaps if if uh, if someone wanted to uh, proceed with a laneway 
home, that it would make it more clear for them to be able to do that on a uh, character home site. Well, this particular policy isn't going to impact laneway houses, and it's not going to impact character at all. Um, there's, it's frustrating because I feel like there's this, like a few character folks out there who constantly misrepresent the impact of some of these policies. Ten years ago, they said these same things about laneway houses. Um, we are doing character infill projects, and when we come, the when a client comes to us, it's because there's already they've made that decision not to to tear down or they want to build something new. If somebody wants to come to us with a character house and do it to the passive house standard, we can do that. But this isn't going. This is only adding four to six percent on a project, and if in the case of a duplex, it's less density than if you have a laneway house. There's there's not going to be any impact on the character homes. Um, so I think it's really a kind of it's the same scare tactic that we hear about every single zoning change to, to single family. I wasn't just talking about the character. I was wondering if is there. Is there a way, do you think that this helps find a way to, for someone who has a character home, if they wanted to build a laneway, would this kind of set the, as you said, uh, before there's been pieces in Passive House, but this helps to bundle it up, and I'm sorry I won't say it as eloquently as you, but offer a small incentive, do you think that's the next step in getting laneway to that, that place as well? Whereas if someone's building a laneway, we'd want them to consider um, doing that in a way where maybe they built their laneway and then their main home afterwards. Some people well, I, I would love to see passive house incentives applied to laneway houses. Um, it's it's actually a little bit frustrating because we we're, we're now working to make all of our laneway houses built to step four of the energy code um, because it's really hard to actually get it to passive house with all the various constraints that we have in place currently. Um, so. I think if some of these incentives were also applied to laneway houses, that would be great. We would do, we would go even further with those laneway house projects. Um, that's but, what. That's what I was. I was wondering. I, I also was wondering if understanding this doesn't apply to specifically um, laneway ho laneway homes. And I will maybe ask staff about this later on, but maybe <coughs> I don't need to um, because because I think it's quite thorough in the report. But this this may. Um, bring us to uh, laneway homes being having specific standards and also bundling that up with an incentive on them as well. Is that something that you would hope for? That's what I would this? hope for in a subsequent work plan. Yeah. Thank you. But this is the first step in your... First step. Yeah, first important step. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kirby. Hi, Mr. Davidson. Um, Hi. Thanks for coming. I always appreciate it when you come to council. Um, so just to be clear, you do work in the passive health space, but you also do work with character homes and, and retention. Is that right? Yeah, we have a character infill under construction. We did a couple of laneway houses at 19th and Ontario with some rehab work behind a couple of really nice character houses. Okay, so you have you have a foot in kind of both both camps, so to speak. We do both. I, I really love to save good character houses. I've dissuaded clients from demoing good character houses. Okay, so on that note, to the concern that we have received is some emails that have come in, in your opinion, as a professional that works in the field, you don't see this, the concern being um, a key one of the fact that this will result in demolition of character or heritage homes. I just want to be very explicit. I, I don't think it'll building. result in any new demolition of character homes. I think our character home incentives are fundamentally flawed and need to be fixed. Um, we, in the moment, our character home policies are standing in the way of the high-performance multifamily housing, small-scale multifamily housing that we need to build in this city. And so our character home incentives, when they were written, were not future-proof because they were not written in a way that works with the allowing the city to actually evolve the way it should be doing. Like a passive house fourplex should be a no-brainer compared to a, a McMansion. But our policies, the way our, our character home rules are set up, they take forever, they're really expensive, and they're very they're just misaligned with what we need to do. So I would love to fix those, but the way we do it isn't by stopping good projects over here. And that's okay. just critical because that it, again and again, we see that the character home is standing in the way of good projects, and I'd really want to fix this over here as a separate process. And, and just to follow up on that for clarity, why is the character home standing in the way of good projects? Can you expand? Uh, just for instance, you're not allowed to do a duplex with a laneway house. And the only reason that is is because they didn't want to preempt the character home incentive. And so ideally, if we're looking at the development, if we have a climate emergency and we want to have more high-performance housing, 
a passive house triplex or fourplex or something like that is really an ideal building form, and that should be something that's allowed to do. But if we're precluding those forms because we don't want to preempt our character homes, then we've got a real process problem with our character home incentives and the way they're written. Um, at the moment, our character home incentives treat a tiny little bungalow the same as like a three or four story big character home. Some character homes have really intrinsic fundamental value because of their size and quality. Some don't. And you know that little bungalow that's only 0.3 FSR, no matter what you're going to do, it's never going to have intrinsic housing value. You know The question is, when we tear it down, do we get something of value in its place, or do we just get a McMansion? Mm -hmm. So we're having the wrong conversation about character. OK. But you don't see them as mutually exclusive. You think this advances, the passive house can move forward, and we should deal with the character separately, but this is not going to negatively impact the character. Not going to negatively. And I would love to do a, a passive, a, you know, character passive house retrofit. Okay. I had some clients talk about it, but it is the process is a challenge. Okay. And final question. Um, in terms of if you could generally characterize, and that's hard to do, but sort of the clientele of people that are looking to build a passive house or to renovate a character house. So you fair to say it's that they're not really motivated by square footage, like they have other priorities or values that they would that are ranked more highly. It's around the retention or it's around the type of building and the green footprint. I mean somebody who's building a new a new home. Yeah. yeah. Um, the square footage always matters. I mean okay. we're always we're always looking to maximize that. The the increase in build costs compared to a code minimum is maybe five to eight percent. Um, we're getting some incentives in terms of building depth and height um, and getting that little bit of extra square footage just makes it that much easier for me to say that I can do passive house on every single project. And if we want to build an industry of people where all the designers, the engineers, the builders, the planners, everybody is creating this whole community of, of learning and expansion, then it needs to have that little bit of incentive um, versus sort of doing things as business as usual. Okay. But it's a nudge. It's not a massive. It's not. It's not tipping scales massively, and it's just giving that bit extra. It's just a tiny bit. It's just enough that I can say you're getting this little tiny bit extra. And for most people, that's that's enough to tip them over the edge. Okay. Super helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hardwick. Five minutes. Hello there. Hi. Um, so I take your point. I, I agree. The character home policy is fundamentally flawed. Um, but I did want to touch on one thing because that the, there is an interface that we're experiencing on a continuum. There's no one size fits all model. Um, and I'm trying to distinguish between heritage and the range of character. Yeah. And so um, you, when you evaluate a character house, you look at whether it's quality or not, right? Whether it's worth, per, worth maintaining and configuring as part of a new development. Uh, I'm looking at quality and size and the height of the basement because a lot of times much of this character stuff triggers around whether or not that basement needs to be lifted because as soon as we need to lift that because that six foot basement already counts as floor area. So if you're going to put a bunch of money into that project, you're going to lift that house up and as soon as you lift it, it means you're gutting the whole thing. So if there was a way to keep those houses intact as they are, they'd be great existing affordable rental and a number of other things. But the way we deal with FSR, especially around basements, means that these things are often getting gutted, at which point there's, there's not really much left of that house. Um, so when I look at an existing character home, I'm looking at the quality of it, um, but also the size. And I think that's something that's been uh, neglected because in the past, in the RT zones, we had a lot of these great big character homes that made really great multiple conversions because they were the inner city streetcar neighborhoods from the 1920s where you had these big homes that made great character conversions. When you get further out into RS, you get these smaller bungalows and lower density things which have a lot less intrinsic value as housing compared to those inner suburbs. And so we're taking, we're cutting RT character ideas, pasting them to R onto RS and pretending like that's gonna work but it's a different urban fabric with a different history. And so we need a different approach. And as far as heritage, like if it's heritage listed, let's do whatever we need to save those. That's a totally separate issue and I'm all on board with that. You know, I think we should go around the city and pick whichever ones are the best and heritage list them and, you know, and then move on with everything else. So that's my two cents. Yeah, no, I totally hear you. I, you know, I had a 1931, you know, that was gutted and, and, and rebuilt, but during the leaky condo era, 
unfortunately. Um, but I take your point, and I just want to be clear that there are houses that are pre-1940 that are not, not really worth saving. So oh, no, there's, there's definitely ones that are teardowns. I mean, we, we built, just built a passive house at East 37th uh, near Main Street, and that 1920s house was in bad shape. Like, it was not something that you were going to that you were going to keep. And in its place, we get a house with a, a basement suite, and it's a passive house. And so the two of them together are using much less energy than that character house was before. And that's a net win for the climate. That's new housing, less emissions in a walkable neighborhood. Like, that's what we should be doing. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Weep. Um, yeah, I'm just looking... Throughout the document, it kind of bounces back and forth. I mean, I'm looking at the summary and recommendations that talks about passive house certified. Mm -hmm. I know that when you actually certify and buying certified equipment, it can increase the costs quite significantly. And you're saying that some of the buildings you're moving to step code four. The laneway houses. The laneway houses. Yeah. Um, do you think that's something that we should look at in this and make an amendment to ensure that we're not just dealing with passive house certified, but we're dealing with stuff that's equivalent or higher? I I don't know the, the staff can answer, but I believe there is flexibility to say passive house certified or step five or some other zero carbon equivalent. Um, I think there is already a degree of flexibility there. I know we generally right now we are certifying our passive house projects yeah. because we're being granted additional height and building depth. And my understanding anyway was that those zoning relaxations were contingent upon certification. Okay, so you get an extra bonus thing if you are certified however. and and some funds that we get from near zero dot ca or from the from zebex they provide a bit of money that's helping to offset the ten thousand dollars of extra modeling and certification costs that would go into that project perfect thank you very much thanks and that's it thank you very much for coming in this evening really appreciate your your input uh we have sean riley next same drill uh <clears throat> up to five minutes and you may have questions sure so my name is Sean Riley, and I'm uh, a homeowner here in Vancouver, and I'm actually one of those evil people that's decided to tear down a character house and build a duplex on an RS1 lot. And uh, this decision is something that's evolved over a, a number of years. We've lived in our house in East Vancouver for 20 years now. We have four kids, and we've raised those four kids in 2,000 square feet, and we've made do. But as our children grow and, and our oldest moved out, we started taking a hard look at what's possible on our lot to provide a long-term living opportunity for our children. And so we made the decision to look at duplex zoning, duplexes with basement suites as a means of providing a long-term home for our family. And so uh, we actually hired Bryn um, and over the last several months, uh, starting actually last spring, worked up a complete set of plans for our home under the existing regulations. And Bryn has done an amazing job with those drawings, but I found the process incredibly frustrating um, because we kept running up against things, you can't do this, a, a lot of just little issues. We ended up with a set of final drawings that were okay, but I felt could be better. And at a point in time, Bryn handed me the, the referral report that had been prepared for council. And this document, I thought, was written about my project because it addresses every issue that we've encountered in the process of arriving at these designs. And we've actually had the opportunity to sit down and, and look at what the drawings are um, under these new regulations. I'm not getting any more rooms. I'm not getting significantly more house, but I'm getting a few very small things that make the final design a little bit better and you've gotten rid of the frustration of back and forth with city. You know, every time somebody submits something and it gets kicked back because we didn't understand the regulations or they weren't exactly clear, I pay someone to redo that. 
and the city pays someone to look at it again. So there is a lot of things happening here that is just simply better in the process for, for me as, as, I guess, the end user. And uh, for those reasons, I really strongly support these changes. Thanks very much. You have some questions? Councillor Harbick, you have the five Hi, minutes. Mr. Riley. Hello. How are you? I'm excellent. I did bring my daughters, by the way. I, uh, they're hiding in the back there. Um, <laughs> they were going to come up and strongly support it as well, but they're busy coloring. So I, I don't think you're evil. Um, so can you describe, and this is actually going to prove my point, I believe. Can you describe the quality of the character house that you currently have? We, we love our house. It is a 1930s. We've never quite figured out exactly when it was built. It has many amazing features in it. Um, but one of the features it was never built with was an, a, an eave overhang. And so after 80 or 90 years of weather in this climate and periods of time where it was a rental house and periods of time where it was poorly maintained, um, water has gotten into the framing. We've had areas of the framing that's rotted. Our foundation is pretty inadequate. It's not... A, we love the interior finishes, we love the character, but the structure itself is in really, really bad shape. And, you know, we've looked at what it would take to sort of bring it up to, to just a very basic standard of a solid house. And we could spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to end up with something that provides us no more living space, no better quality of living, than what's there right now. And, and for us, that's simply a non-starter. We, we simply can't justify that cost. So you weighed the difference between um, any kind of additional FSR that you could get through the character house um, we, door versus what you could get through the... I, the I, I, I can door. promise you that Bryn is not lying when he says that he twists his client's arms on, on that. Um, he brought it up at about four different stages as we talked through the design. And um, after 20 years of living in the house and 20 years of fixing everything that was wrong with it along the way, um, I, I'm fully aware of, of just how much work would be required. And at the end of the day, um, the plans we have are a duplex with basement suites, Four units, we have four children. One day, all of our kids potentially have a place to live. The house we have right now, 2,000 square feet, and our oldest is away at university. At some point in time, he's going to boomerang back to us. And I really want somewhere other than my house to put him. I totally get it. I, I like the intergenerational uh, aspect to it. Um, and it does, you know, conform with the missing middle and gentle density that we want to see in neighborhoods. I think the, the, the fine point is understanding the balance between the character and the passive house in this case. So thank you very much for your illustration. Thank you. Councillor Kirby. Um, thank you for being here. Um, so it's good to sort of hear the, sh the actual lived experience. I think Councillor Hardwick touched on it, but just for clarity, you said you get a little extra than you would otherwise. Can you just provide us specifics on what that well mean by that? Um, in our drawings um, one of the reasons that we actually went to Bryn besides his background with passive house um, we've seen some of his laneway house designs and we knew that fitting everything that we wanted into our house was going to require somebody who was incredibly good at layout and fitting things into small spaces um, when we went through the first design, we, we run into little issues like he's got to go through and figure out where all these various exclusions fit. And so, um, if you have an exclusion for one particular thing, you, you can't apply it anywhere else. Um, you know, you, you have to, ha you have an exclusion for mechanical room. I don't pretend to know all of this stuff. 
When all those exclusions are put together into a single number, it gives us a little bit of flexibility um, to adjust the design a little bit. And that 4% is not anything more than rooms that were squeezed down to the smallest that you could, like we're looking at bedrooms that are at the code minimum size for a bedroom, which puts you at, you can have a single bed and you can choose between a bedside table or a small dresser. And so we're able to take rooms like that and make them one foot bigger. It's, it, it really is, it's very small square footage, but it's huge in terms of the ultimate usability of those spaces. And certainly for us, um, you know, when you look at the drawings and you sort of pause and say, do we really want to go this route with, you know, with all the extra cost of, of the passive house and that, to have these incredibly cramped rooms and that sort of thing. So, yeah. It makes sense. Thank you very much. Thank you, and that's it for questions. Appreciate you coming in this evening. Thank you. Uh, Lucio uh, Pinciano. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thanks for allowing me to speak. Um, <clears throat> I'm Lucio Picciano from DLP Architecture, and uh, we uh, designed and built the first certified passive house in Vancouver in 2016, and have since certified four more in the city with uh, three or four more slated for certification this year. So we have quite a bit of experience uh, both, both on the modeling and design side, but also in uh, twisting the arm of clients to go that route. And this is a, an important point uh, because without incentives, uh, we feel that uh, probably three quarters of our previous clients would not have gone the passive route. Uh, that extra FSR that has been described uh, up till now is really crucial. Uh, it is a small step, in our opinion, um, with how we see the urban fabric growing for the future. Uh, but even with these incentives, it's important to note that the massing and the, uh, the morphology of the city really doesn't change very drastically. So on that side, it's a small, um, it, it's, it's a small Go action to the city, but it really is huge with respect to our uh, climate goals. Today, you, you cannot separate energy efficiency from architecture and design. To do so is simply not socially responsible. Uh, we can easily achieve high energy standards for almost any style, but we need incentives to make this decision more economically viable. This is important uh, so as not to lock in another 50 or 100 years of uh, excessive energy consumption. Now, I'd like to speak towards um, the issue of character heritage and new construction. Staff, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's already uh, a bonus uh, FSR for retaining character homes in the RS zone. So uh, <clears throat> we're already starting at a, a different, uh, uh, an non-level playing field when, when we're talking about demo or new construction. Uh, we have actually uh, two uh, character retention projects underway right now. Um, this is one on Parker, in, uh, just off Commercial Drive, it's 1725 Parker. Now, this one is a character retention duplex, but did not go the certified passive house route, which for uh, retention is Enter the Enterfit program. And specifically, the reason why this one did not go that route um, is a lot of these homes uh, are already um, non-compliant with regard to code, and some of those non-compliance issues are, are not relaxable. The one specifically for this project was projection into side yards. So we're already below the one meter projection into the side yard. 
we cannot thicken the walls beyond what they already are. And to reduce uh, that area by thickening them to the interior of the house uh, is, is simply not viable. And then with the FSR that we're already at, which is compliant per the zoning right now, we couldn't add any more to stretch the building. So we, there's no way for us to make up that lost FSR. So by upgrading this house, we've automatically reduced the livable area within for the tenants. So I can't blame them for not going interfit. <clears throat> but if we had those incentives, uh, that extra percentage would easily have swayed this client. And I will add that of our 10 or 12 projects within the city, that's a, there's a vast range of personalities that are involved. Uh, some that come to us for passive house, no matter what, they'll say, at all costs, go for it. Some that don't know and are easily swayed. Some that don't care at all and still don't know what passive house is, but will do it because of the incentives. We don't care why they do it. We just want them to do it. So we'll take any reason to go that route. <clears throat> Uh, what happened here? Okay, so this is the, the same house that you can see is stilted now. And <clears throat> uh, one thing to add about some comments that were, oh God, I'm at five minutes already. Jeez. <laughs> five seconds left, yeah. Okay. But you do have a question from Councillor Swanson. Okay. It goes fast. <laughs> okay, Done. thank you very much, Councillor Swanson. That went by fast. Thank you. Yeah. So these passive houses that you're building... Yes. Are they mostly strata, or are some of them rental? I've, uh, I've got everything in our office. We have everything from single family with secondary suite to multifamily, and what everything it, in between. What would be the rents in the multifamily? The multifamilies right now are only strata, yeah. We have okay. rental in other cities, but not in Vancouver. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much, and that's it for questions. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much for coming in. Uh, Council, that's it for uh, registered speakers at this point. So I'll make a call. Does anybody else like to speak to this item? If you'd like to call, I've got the second call. Anybody else like to come up and speak to this? Third and final call. Thanks very much then. So seeing there are no speakers, the speakers list is now closed. Uh, received few or no public comments were received on this item after 5 p.m. today. So uh, we should close the list of uh, the receipt of public comments and move on to hearing closing comments. Uh, staff have any closing comments they'd like to make? Okay, thanks. And uh, it looks like we might have some questions for staff. From Councillor Hardwick? Questions to staff? I was actually going to move the motion. Okay. But I was before. Oh, you, it's your privilege. Yeah, you can move the motion. Um, sorry. <laughs> Um, I'd, I'd like to move the motion, um, and I also have an amendment. Okay, so you're going to move it with. You're you're going to move it with the uh, to your added text. Yes, and please, the which I circulated earlier. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, so we will move to the main queue now. You can do, if you put yourself on the uh, queue. In a parliamentary sure, Councillor Ajanova. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Understanding that we're in a quasi-judicial um, hearing, and I'm not concerned that I was on the queue first to move the motion, but I didn't hear Councillor Hardwick use the language of the yellow memo, um, so I wanted to make sure that we were moving this right. with the yellow memo. I haven't seen these amendments yet, but um, I'm okay. just wondering if, if for... For legal reasons, is is there any yeah, any reason this should come? An amendment should come after a motion at public hearing. Sorry. After the recommendations have been moved, then okay. No, nope, you can Thank move you. a report with an additional item, and that's what's done here. And we've got a queue. And Councillor Hardwick, please go ahead. Thank you very much. So, um, in addition to point A um, and referring to. Um, Appendix A, um, adding on to page two of five there, uh, at 10.23.A.6, in this case six, um, that um, this not apply to uh, heritage register um, homes or houses 
and qualified character homes as defined. And I, I think we heard clearly from staff and, and from also from uh, people in the development community that there is a differentiation between character houses and that they should not all be treated the same. So I wanted to emphasize that. But that in every case, I think um, we agree that, that heritage should be uh, specifically protected. And the, it's really a question of competing um, incentives here. We're trying to promote two things and, and we're trying to find a win-win situation between them. So I, I, I'm a, a very enthusiastic supporter of, of the pass, Passive House movement and what's being done with this memo. I just want to make sure that heritage and qualifying uh, character is specifically respected. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's on the floor. And Councillor Dejanova, up to five minutes. Thanks. I have a point of information. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, sure. to staff, as to what they, because this is very legal, it's a bit different than interpretation here for. Sure. Absolutely. Um, so thank you for indulging me with this this point of information. Um, what is a qualified character house? Because I don't see a specific policy named here. I was just wondering if qualified character house, because I just, I looked it up in our city archives and looking through the development schedule. I don't see qualified character houses, a schedule of development. So are you looking for a... I'm, I'm wondering how staff would interpret that, considering right. this is a formal text amendment. Okay. Um, maybe we can start with the city manager. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm not aware that there is a definition um, as outlined to your question. Okay. So can okay. Um, Shailen so, or so Teresa, can you elaborate? Thank you. Sorry, I just realized this is very formal and text amendments. Sure. That's the reason is we're there, here tonight. Is there a definition there a such amendment? as this? Character merit assessment? I don't believe that's the language that's in That's not the language the that's in no, here. I don't think. Anyway, we have, we'll just uh, go Qualified is different like than to I think know. what's in there, which is character merit. Yeah. yeah. We could take a pause if folks need to check. Could I um, Just one second. move a recess, Mr. Mayor? Just a minute. second. Go ahead. No, thank you. To uh, answer your question regarding uh, Heritage Register and qualified character, mm -hmm. there is a formal definition, of course, of the Heritage Register because council must approve any addition or deletion from the Heritage Register. Um, qualified character does not have a formal definition in the sense, um, so I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So um, I appreciate that. And for that reason, Mr. Mayor, because I was trying to look up qualified character home, yep. um, I would ask you to maybe consider a ruling on this amendment. Okay. Just just maybe um, I'm happy to call a recess if you need to consider. No, no that's okay. I'll just uh, step out for a second, but I will pause your timer and you have two and a half minutes left, but I'll talk to, the, if I could talk to the city manager, perhaps the clerk. Hey, we have checked with uh, we have checked with legal. Oh, I have to wait for quorum. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have checked with legal, and they uh, suggest this is out of order uh, because, again, this is a uh, you know we are amending a law uh, as opposed to a motion where there's interpretation, and so um, so I will uh, abide by that ruling and rule that this is. Uh, 
this clause hmm, is not in order, but I'm not quite sure what we do with that, and I'll be right back with you. Uh, so, uh, because the entire motion was moved with an additional language that is uh, out of order, then the entire uh, motion uh, the, the, is, is out of order, as per usual. It just seems to be longer than usual and is the staff report. So the whole thing is out of order and we don't actually have anything on the floor. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm still in the queue, am I? You are. Um, may I move the recommendations with the yellow memo? Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Do we have a seconder for that? Thank you, Councillor Boyle. So we're, um, uh, right, and that's where and we are. I'd, I'd be happy to speak to this. Uh, I, I spent a long time here, as did Councillor Carr, when we went through the HRA in Shaughnessy, and there were individuals who showed us photos and, and begged staff to consider what a character home was. I know that staff have in, embarked on this journey many times, and, and I think that for that reason, they, they do assessments individually and carefully of that because it's very hard to define, and we really wouldn't want any unintended consequences, any uh, architecturally meritorious homes. Um, to be demolished, but at the same time, there are homes on the Heritage Register um, that maybe also needed to be reviewed at that time. Um, I'm, I'm speaking to this recommendation, considering the fact that the, the previous recommendation was out of order that was tabled, and I think that staff have really been very thoughtful with this in working through how how we're best going to see Passive House achieved in the city of Vancouver. And what I'm hearing from some of the speakers also, and those with expertise um, and industry experience, uh, is that this not only will make it easier uh, to build Passive House, but perhaps there's the option uh, eventually that this will be a springboard for laneway homes, for uh, laneway homes uh, where character homes also can coexist. So I think that it's really important that we remember that this is one step. This is a text amendment. And it doesn't mean that others won't come after it. It doesn't mean that we don't deal with uh, heritage or character homes or in other ways. But for that reason, I certainly will be supporting the staff recommendations with the yellow memo as they currently are. Thanks very much. Thank Councillor Boyle. Thanks, and I'll also um, be uh, supporting these amendments um, and will be brief just to say I, I really appreciate the balancing and weaving together of these various priorities and um, helping us understand how they layer on top of each other um, and shape the type of city um, that we uh, that we grow into. Um, and I also think it's really important to recognize that the housing that we're building or uh, retrofitting and repairing now is the housing that our residents will live in for 20 and 50 years. This is, uh, these are homes that we need to have be carbon neutral as soon as possible 10 years ago, but now is uh, as best we can do at this point. And so it's critical that we figure out how as many of the projects that are being built now as possible can be passive house and that we keep moving those incentives forward so that we uh, are addressing this issue as quickly as we can and decreasing the emissions that our buildings produce. So very happy to see this um, and very happy to support it. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hardwick, up to five minutes. Um, again, I would like to uh, look at bringing back an amendment. It's your privilege. Um, and as I'm just having some technical difficulties, if I could remove the reference to character homes and just uh, oh, what, heritage. Oh, submitted in writing. Uh, again, this is a quasi-judicial uh, hearing, so it's not uh, like a regular council meeting. So um, I was mistaken, actually. You have about uh, three minutes left.
I could move on to the next speaker and then uh, put you back on the end of the list if you like. Yes, please, I'll pass. Okay, thank you. Councillor Carr, up to five minutes. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm going to speak to the motion as it is on the floor um, and, uh, and say that uh, clearly for me it's important to have both more passive house houses, homes in this city, and it is also important for me to see character homes and heritage homes retained more in this city. Um, in, in terms of uh, this particular um, uh, proposal in front of us, or application in, in front of us to change regulations. The issue for me is, will these incentives lead to more um, of the character or heritage homes being replaced? And so I go back to some of the numbers, and um, that we're losing a lot of character homes in this city. Uh, I think the last time that I, I checked, it was like one a day. Um, and yet, um, there's somewhere staff said between one and ten. I mean, we've had ten applications, but not that many have been built. So there's very few um, uh, of these homes anywhere in the city. And I didn't ask the question, but I'm assuming that not all of those are, even if it's the maximum of ten or four or even one, are not on lots that have character or heritage homes. I'm not quite sure, but there's very, very few. So for me, there's a real advantage in moving forward with these because I believe there is a greater good in terms of the of what it's achieving in terms of the kinds of homes we need to move forward with altogether. That is not to say I um, don't believe that there is merit in us looking as a council back at the incentives for retaining character homes and heritage homes, but particularly character homes in this city. I agree entirely with the speaker, uh, Mr. Davidson, who said that the character home retention policies are fundamentally flawed and need to be fixed. Those are my words exactly. I totally agree with that. We failed as a council. Um, previously to develop enough incentives in terms of a differential between tear down and new build and retention and keep the character home to enable people to make that choice to retain like the RT7 and RT8 zoning did in Kitsilano. And I would love to see us, um, I, I mean, I've actually asked for it, but maybe we'll have to push even harder to, to get another look at that character home uh, retention. So meanwhile, for me, on this particular case, um, if we, 56% um, of our emissions in the city of greenhouse gas emissions are, are from uh, buildings. So we need to get our buildings uh, to zero, um, zero emission buildings, capacitive house homes get, get us there. Um, so I want to see those, these incentives move forward, and I want to see us pursue as a council outside of this public hearing, move on better retention incentives for character homes. Thank you. Councillor DeGenova? I just wanted to close, Mr. Mayor, as I move the motion. Uh, you um, have yourself on the I list. I didn't see I mean, anyone you have the floor, there. but Thank Councillor you. Hardwick. Oh, I will. Oh. All right, I'll allow Councillor Hardwick, or I would ask you to allow Councillor Hardwick to go okay, first. Okay, you're going to see the floor, Councillor Hardwick. Sure, go ahead, Councillor Hardwick. Thank you. I thought I'd take another stab at, at this amendment, uh, focusing specifically on houses covered under the Heritage Register. Uh, minimally, minimally, I would like to make sure that those are specifically uh, protected. One second. Yep, I'm just reading the uh, amendment here. Okay, we have a point of order, Councillor Ijanova. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I assumed that the register meant that they couldn't be torn down to build a passive home. Is that correct? Because right now it says passive house does not apply on properties. So would that, would that then 
mean that it's the entire property. So if there was infill or laneway home, I, I need that answered because I I just I feel that the heritage sorry my point of order is the heritage register um, already defines protected properties. So I don't know how we could build a passive home in place of that. Okay. So I'm, I'm kind of confused by a this. Point, a point of order is that there's a, a, a precedent yes. that's being broken. So is it? And, and that is the precedent that's being broken. I understand that this is redundant because okay. the Heritage You're Register already. A, a ruling on yes, the. My, my apologies. Yes. It's been a long day. So okay. Uh, a okay. ruling on that. Okay. So we need a ruling on this one. And I will stop uh, your timer, Councillor Hardwick, and I will talk with the clerk and city manager. Okay, uh, it does look like uh, this isn't redundant because we haven't passed uh, something similar, uh, but we did check further and it's it's uh, not out of order either. So it's uh, on the floor. So Councillor Harvick, you still have the floor. You wanna speak to it? I'd just like to be clear that my objective with this amendment is, is not to constrain the opportunities for passive home development at all, but rather to find a way uh, for a win-win. As Councillor Carr quite eloquently described just now, um, it's, we're, we have more about character houses, but minimally on the Heritage Register, we have such a limited number that are still there. There's nothing preventing laneway houses or, or other forms that are, you know, involve retention as part of the redevelopment. So I'm, I'm just trying to find a win-win uh, that serves both sides, and I think this accomplishes it. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we have an amendment queue. We need somebody to second this. Okie doke. So now we're on the amendment queue. Um, I think it's clear now. Does anybody want to speak to that? Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor, I just have a point of information okay. for you to staff. And I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I was hoping not to have to do this, but hearing Councillor Hardwick's comments about, and, and I think I want the, some of the same things, but the language here is the whole property. So technically, you could have a character home and have nothing right now on the back of that and build a laneway house that's passive. But now this says property. So, or, you, sorry, you couldn't have character, you could have a home on the Heritage Register that was allowed to have infill on it, and you could not build passive house on that land. That's my question. Is that how staff would interpret this? If a laneway policy came after this, it would not apply to this. I'm May I sure. ask a question? Uh, perhaps, manager, point of information, perhaps we could steer it over to your, your crew over there. So staff have conferred based on that comment and 
the way it's worded now implies, and we'd have to um, confirm with law to be sure, but it implies that the whole property would, would be um, stricken from taking advantage of this. So if a, somebody wanted to build a laneway house on the back of the lot, um, they would not be able to get the uh, incentive if they wanted to do it to a passive house standard. Um, well, sorry, or another, another building, not necessarily laneway. But um, if it was amended to say the building as opposed to the property, that would then focus just on the building. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm I'm going to take myself off the list in, in just a moment, but I'm going to say that if it was amended um, to say that, I'd be supportive of that. I just don't think we need to include the whole property in that. I think that that ties the hands of some of these um, owners of these uh, properties that are on our register that may need to may want to consider this, and it may be the difference for them between keeping their home or not, uh, or selling that, or uh, doing something else. So I, I think we have to consider the unintended consequences, and I don't see anything about this in the public consultation. So I'd be comfortable if it said the property, as staff had said, but I mean, I don't mean to uh, nitpick here, but I, I, really, I really would hope, Councillor Hardwick, that you would try again and maybe amend your own amendment, and I could support that. So I'll take myself off the queue. Just wanted to state. Okay, thank you, Councillor Domenato. Uh, my question's been answered, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hardwick. Yes. Uh, city Manager, yeah, go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, through the mayor, if I might. Um, also, uh, if you're gonna be making changes, Councillor Hardwick, law has suggested that we change the word on to the word to. Thank you. Uh, so about how, so how about two buildings listed on the heritage register? I think that's what you're saying on buildings yep. as opposed to I'm sorry, on, I think it's the, two? I think you're on the you're on the wrong two. Okay. And not apply two buildings, I think is the the way you're suggesting, right? Yep. Can you highlight the change? So uh, I take it Councillor Hardwick you're suggesting an amendment to your Yes, amendment. the amendment, and, and I, I take the city manager's note there. But I, I think the key thing was the replacement of the word buildings instead of properties. Right. So if you clerk could also highlight I, that. That's right. I mean, that, that would now be buildings. Okay. So do we have a... And, and a good point, Councillor Fry, that uh, the, the term building should be used in both places uh, where it says houses, those houses should also be building, okay. buildings. So is that your complete amendment then? Yes, okay, I apologize so for... No problem. We're on the amendment for amendment Q. Uh, would anybody like to speak to this? Councillor Carr. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a point of information through you um, sure. to staff. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if staff can um, uh, refresh my memory on under what circumstances can a heritage, a home on the heritage register be replaced by a new build of any kind? McLean, Planning and Development. Um, a building that's on the register uh, is not protected, it's simply listed, so it can be replaced, it can be demolished, um, uh, provided that all other permits are in place. That's how the Vancouver Charter uh, describes it. So a building can be replaced. The, the, the condition is typically the director of planning will not consider any conditional provisions if the building on the register is lost. It can only achieve the outright provisions of the zoning. Okay, so um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to staff again. Um, so the issue here yes. is that there would be no extra density um, if a, a heritage home was torn down and replaced by a regular home. Um, but if it was to be replaced by a passive house home, there would be extra density that would be allowed in a new build. That, that's that's what is at play here. Is that right? Well, my understanding is that if depending if if this 
extra density is considered conditional, then we do not, uh, the Director of Planning does not um, allow for the conditional provisions to be considered. So it couldn't anyway then? A, a passive house could not be? I'm sorry, I don't understand that. So because a passive house has got conditional um, density, according to uh, the proposal that's in front of us now, um, if this were, if this were, if that amendment were not to take place, even if that amendment were not to take place, and somebody applied for the building of a passive home, if it was to replace a heritage home, it could not have any extra density that we would normally give a passive house. It's just that, because it is already. That is, that is my understanding, because the objective is to retain all buildings on the register and use incentives to have those buildings retained. Got it. All right. So that's okay. That's and and the uh, and the demolition permit to clarify that's uh, issued by the director of planning. Right. Yeah. Okay. Anything else to add? Yes, I I do have uh, yeah. another comment to add then, and that is that I, I, this is. Um, it doesn't seem reasonable to me that we as a council would say that we don't want a heritage home to be replaced by a passive home um, compared to being replaced by any other home. Um, so we would, it, this would prejudice um, the market to deliver the building of a new non-passive home on a, her on a heritage home lot if it was approved to be done that way. I mean, there's still some protections for heritage homes, but not, but it's not fully protected. So, um, and the character home incentives, which might lead some to think, oh, we don't want to allow character homes because there's even more of an incentive to tear down a heritage home, don't appear from what I've heard from staff to apply. So, in other words, it's no, there's no extra incentive um, to build, to knock down a heritage home and replace it with a passive home. Um, and if somebody was going to knock down a heritage home, they could just do a regular home and there'd be no incentives for them to put up a passive home. So, I cannot see the, the value in this. Okay, thanks very much. Um, no, not. Councillor Boyle. Um, thanks. I will just uh, echo what Councillor Carr has said, that it, it's not clear to me that this um, makes any significant difference, and, and um, so I won't be supporting. I'm indifferent to the amendment to the amendment to change it to buildings because I um, won't be supporting the first level amendment. Okay, thanks. Councillor Weeb. I, I, as well, I understand the direction of preserving heritage homes, and I'm very supportive. However, here, I think that there is good retention if we're doing passive house retrofits or onto these buildings, so there's incentives in that sense. If it pulls off the registry, I would like to see it be a passive house. I know they don't get the incentives because it's on the registry, so I think this is, to Carr's point, is actually against it. So I'll be voting against this, and I do hope that we do get the heritage and character home um, policy back sooner than later because it is something that's been brought up multiple times at public hearings. Thanks very much, Councillor Leishanova. I, I urge Councillor Hardwick to, I, I would hope Councillor Hardwick might withdraw this amendment to the, her amendment and then further her amendment. Uh, the reason for this is I was trying to find a middle ground because I do, uh, as others have stated, support heritage homes, but the fact is, is that that's a completely different matter. That's a different public hearing. That's like saying here, right now, that we're not going to, uh, when we talk about green demolition, we're not going to do that because that would mean demolishing possibly uh, a, a home on the heritage register. So we don't say no to green demolition because we don't want homes to be demolished and then people demolish the way that they did before we had green demolition. So I think that, you know, Councillor Hardwick, I take I take your point, I understand it, I tried to help, but I, I can't support it the way it is. I would hope you would withdraw it because I understand what you're trying to achieve, but I don't think it's here that you would achieve that. I think it's at a council meeting where you'd bring a motion and put some direction forward to staff. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hardwick. 
And um, my interpretation is, is, is different than what is being expressed here. And, uh, but in the interest of moving this forward and in the interest of revisiting it in a more complete way, I will withdraw the amendment as suggested. But I do want to be clear about this, that the, the, the objection is to have competing incentives. And um, I don't want uh, one to trump the other so to speak, and that was the intention here, is that as much as we want to, to foster the development of passive homes, we don't want to do it at the expense of, of Heritage Register buildings. Thanks so much. Uh, so what we need to do then is uh, to withdraw your amendment to your amendment and then withdraw your amendment. So, okay, so you're gonna, you have to move a motion to... I, mo I move a motion to withdraw, withdraw amendment. the amendment to the amendment. Okay, we have a seconder for that. Okay, all in favor? Any opposed? So and then I reckon the amendment. That's right. So we'll do the same. Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. That's done too. So we'll go back to the main queue. Uh, Councillor Hardwick, anything else? Uh, no. I, uh, that was uh, interesting, but thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councillor Dejanova, you... Thanks very much. Just to close on the motion, I really appreciate the work that staff put into this. I uh, appreciate the speakers coming out and sharing the insight with us about how Passive House um, can be done differently and better. And thanks for the information on character homes and uh, the the HRA as well, or, or sorry, the Heritage Registry uh, that we have at the City of Vancouver here. Uh, I predict that there may be some motions coming forward on that, but I really want to focus on what we have in front of us, which really will incentivize um, passive homes in the city of Vancouver. And although I asked about accessibility, I don't feel that it needs to be put in this specific uh, recommendation with the, with the yellow memo. Um, I'm confident that staff will consider that as they are um, on a completely different, you know, streamline of accessibility and accessible path. And I know that the intention was to bring something back to council eventually on that. And I trust that our staff will do that. So for that reason, I am wholeheartedly support this. But my support for this doesn't mean that I don't support heritage in our city. Um, it's simply um, they're two different policies, and as we just saw, uh, they they intertwine in ways that that perhaps uh, at the end of the day can be frustrating to those people who who really um, are trying to uh, not only follow our rules and guidelines here in the city of Vancouver, um, but to make sure that we make sense of these policies. I think that it's it's really great to have that extra. Um, to have the extra insight of individuals in the community who have done this themselves. So for that reason, I support staff's recommendations and want to thank you for what you brought forward, including the yellow memo. Thank you. So uh, that's it for speakers. Um, so we can call a vote on this uh, report. Councilor Dejanova. Well, there you go, uh, Councillor Dominato, Councillor Kirby Young, and that has passed unanimously. Thanks very much, Council. Thanks very much, staff and speakers. Uh, okay, so next is um, Heritage on uh, Commercial Street. Uh, we do not have speakers, so we could waive the presentation. We have Hugh McLean here, I think. Gonna raise up that. Uh, we raise up the desk there, uh, clerks. Thank you. Hey, there is any. Uh, I'm just gonna check with council. Uh, does anybody like to see the presentation? So we would like to see the presentation if that's uh, possible. But we're going to read the application first. This is an application by the General Manager of Planning, Urban Design and Sustainability to add the existing building at 3495-3505 Commercial Street, known as the Broadhurst and Whitaker Block, to the Vancouver Heritage Register in the C evaluation category, and to designate the exterior 
and structure of the existing building to secure the long-term protection of the heritage property from inappropriate alterations and demolition. No correspondence has been received on this application since it was scheduled for public hearing and prior to the close of the speaker's list and receipt of public comments. This represents all correspondence received up to 5 p.m. today. Thanks very much. And uh, so we can walk through the presentation. That would be great. I got a mic problem here. There we go. Okay. No. Good evening, Mayor and Council. The item for your approval at this public hearing is the addition of the building at 3495 to 3505 Commercial Street to the Vancouver Heritage Register as a C listing and the Heritage Designation Bylaw to protect its exterior and structure. The proposal includes adding a floor to the top of the Heritage Building, which will be recessed from the front and to construct a four-story infill building at the rear. The Heritage Building will accommodate four street-level commercial units. The upper floors, along with the infill, will accommodate 18 residential units, four of which are to be rental. As part of the development permit application, the applicant is seeking a modest amount of, of residential floor area, which is 8% beyond permitted, and that is to be assigned to common circulation areas such as corridors and balconies. The other relaxations sought as part of the development permit are on-site parking and rear yard setback for the proposed infill building. There is a high degree of retention and the project is in line with accepted standards and guidelines for heritage conservation. The Director of Planning is seeking Council's approval of the addition to the Heritage Register and approval of the Heritage Designation Bylaw as a condition of the development permit. I can answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Okay, and do we have the uh, applicant team here? There you are, thanks very much. Um, let's see, did you want to speak to the application at all? Perfect. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. And I've got uh, Councillor Swanson on the queue to ask questions. So there's four rental units and 14 strata proposed plus some commercial. Is that right? That's right. Do we have any idea what the rents will be? Uh, no, I don't know what the rents will be. There's no limits on them or anything? No. And are there any community CACs or DCLs being uh, paid? Yes, DCLs are collected as part of the development permit application for all the new floor area, both commercial and residential. But no CACs? Uh, no, D DCLs. Okay, thanks. Thank you, and that is it for questions. Um, oh, Councillor Kirby Young, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I just had a quick one, and I just I realized that this is not sort of an application for the heritage um, designation, but I'm just wondering um, why the report doesn't specifically list the applicant. I know that our information sheet does tonight, but we typically get that listed on the rezoning applications. Why is that? Uh, typically with heritage applications, we haven't listed them. We haven't been asked to provide that information. Okay. Yeah, I... Okay. I was, I was just curious because we get just in terms of consistency or I wonder if there's any reason or transparency like we get it on an info sheet but not on the public document okay um, and the parking is going to be underground for in the infill building or where's the parking located with the setback all the way to the lane I just wanted to clarify I wasn't clear on that parking our details just design the parking it's at grade. Yes. It's at grade. Yes. So where is it if that 25 feet or whatever, if the building's going all the way back with that relaxation? I was just trying to kind of contextually place it. Hi, Mariana Modillo. I'm the architect for this project. So the parking is in the infill building at the lane at uh, below the level of the residential floor. So there's a podium level that's got a deck. Oh, okay. And then above that is the residential. So below that podium is all the parking, including car share. Okay. And there's mm -hmm. the four floors then 
Is the four floors of residential on, in addition to the podium? No, it's, it's... It's one of the four. Yeah, it's one of the four. Okay. Um, and it also referenced that they're highly livable units in size. They, Does that mean larger? Um, they range in size. We've got a diversity of unit mix, and livability to us doesn't necessarily relate to uh, square footage, but it relates to good design. All of the uh, units are through units, so they have access to fresh air and daylight from both ends, not just one. They all have access to the shared common courtyard. And um, I think they're all pretty good sizes. Like they're not, we don't have anything micro, but the units in the heritage building um, run from about five to 600 square feet. And that's due to the character, the heritage retention. Okay, and yeah. then one, one additional question if I can, just a quick mm -hmm. one is, um, so I'm having trouble containing my enthusiasm for this project. So I think yeah, it's beautiful. Thanks. What's the character going to be of the uh, of the the infill units going to mimic some of the character? Are they going to be more modern? Um, it is a modern approach that's reflective of the surrounding context, which is amazing. Commercial Street is such a rich and diverse part of our city um, that is benefits from sort of its mix of industrial and residential. So there's a lot of industrial uh, use of concrete blocks. So we're using a, um, a brick sort of sized uh, block that is reflective of the surrounding context. We also have um, small touches that reflect the heritage building, and the heritage building will be completely restored to its original condition. Okay, amazing. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks very much. Just before we move on to Councillor Weave, just, just to remind uh, folks that we're just looking at the heritage designation here. We're not doing on the approval of the building. Is that that's correct? We're, that's correct. Right. So it's a, a more limited kind of consideration tonight. But with that in mind, on to Councillor Weave. Um, yeah, it talks about the Heritage Registry C. I'm wondering what, it, what, how close was it to moving up to Registry B, or is it only C for facades? Uh, no, it's not C for facades. It's simply um, a, a number of criteria that come together, which would be architectural, historical, cultural, um, and the, the, the context which the building is within, yeah. plus its integrity. And all those come together in a score which will rank it either an A, B, or C. So it's, um, it, it was fairly close to being a B, I think, when, when the evaluation was done, it, but it was still the high C listing. Okay, and how is the inappropriate alterations reviewed? Is that done by city staff, or, right? Because it talks about it won't allow the property to have inappropriate alterations. So is that if the property owner wants to make alterations in the future, there's a covenant to not touch the facade? Or how is that monitored and enforced? Yes, that's a good question. Well, um, as with any designated protected heritage building, um, a heritage alteration permit is required for any future alterations. So it doesn't mean that the exterior can't be touched. It simply means that changes will be, need to be made in a way that are compatible with the character. Um, so certain materials will not be appropriate, whereas others would be. Um, you know, wood windows as opposed to vinyl windows. Um, if the cladding had to be repaired, for instance, uh, we wouldn't seek its removal in whole unless there were a, a structural reason for it. We would look at cladding that were compatible, the same material, and typically wood cladding. Okay, and I guess question to the proponent. Was the process of going for Heritage C something that you were looking at on the onset of this project? And um, or were there elements that you weren't able to save because it was more difficult or less difficult in the actual process? Um, so I just want to be clear that the proposal is for the full retention of the entire building. It's not for just the facade retention. Okay. And the owner came with us with the intent to retain the existing building. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. Um, thanks, and I'm actually not sure who this is a question um, to, but I'm wondering the small businesses that are currently in those buildings will stay or well, un unclear? Currently, um, I've been advised by the architect that there are no um, businesses in those units right now, so they'll be seeking new commercial businesses to fill the, f the four units. Okay, so it's not where the Commercial Street Cafe is, it's just over from there? It's been just... Up for the one at uh, further to the south? I'll Google map it. Sorry, I was picturing, I guess, this. There is one at the corner of building. 22nd, yes. if that's yeah. the one. Yes, that, that was designated a few years ago, okay. uh, about 10 years ago, I believe. Okay, so great. That. Okay, that's all. Thanks for helping me yeah. place myself in that. Thanks. 
Okay, thanks. Councillor Dishnova. I was prepared to move the motion. We have Councillor Kirby Young on the list. Councillor Kirby Young, do you have a question? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I'm happy move to motion. move the motions. Okay, thank you. Remove the staff recommendations in a motion. Thank you. Thanks very much. And but we didn't, uh, sorry, I didn't call for public yet. Oh, my apologies. Uh, so, uh, so sorry, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Right. So any other questions from, nope, or for the applicant? Nope. Okay, thanks. So there's nobody on the uh, formal speakers list, but I will call three times. Anybody else like to speak to this or anybody like to speak to this? Heritage designation. Going twice. Going three times. Okay, thanks. So there are no speakers. The speakers list is now closed. Uh, there's no public comments. Uh, so we'll close the receipt of these and then uh, ask if, does the applicant have any closing comments? Thank you, uh, staff. Okay, we're gonna get you to a limbo there. Uh, um, uh, Council, have any questions? We have Councilor Kirby Young, did you have questions or? No, okay. Thank you. Uh, so now we can move. Okay. Oh, sorry. I saw Councillor Kirby Young was. Who's going to? Somebody just. Okay. Th you're going to move it, Councillor? Is that good? Okay. Thanks. Here we go. Any debate? Anybody want to debate this? Okay. Please put yourself on the list and away you go. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really happy to see a project like this come forward. It's, it was actually really exciting reading the other night. Um, not that public hearing reading isn't always, um, but the, uh, the retention of, I was actually on this block um, and I went to job fair and I stopped for a cup of coffee and I actually wandered down this couple of blocks and I thought, wow, it would be so amazing to see this restored and it is looking run down and dingy, but it looks a little bit like an old movie set that's just waiting to be brought back to life and to sort of see some of the description of the features such as um, the bay windows, the Edwardian era and the parapets, um, and here the, ra the rear veranda on the second story with the open wooden balustrade, um, I think is magical and I think we want to be applauding um, people that are willing to bring forward and support the heritage register, um, but look at innovative use in conjunction with bringing life in um, with both residential and commercial. So. I'm really excited to see the revitalization of this area in this block, and I hope this engenders some similar applications um, in the area because it is a really um, creative um, and sort of character-filled part of the city, right, in terms of the feeling that it evokes. So um, I just want to say this is a really exciting project to get amidst some of the more cookie-cutter ones that we see, and uh, I appreciate the thinking behind it. I'm fully supportive. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Swanson? Yeah, um, I don't hate heritage, but <laughs> I, it really bugs me that virtually all of the housing that we're approving is for pretty people that have fairly high incomes. Like, not even one cheap unit in this building or in this project. So I think, I think that's a problem that I think this council has to deal with, that all of these projects that we're approving are for housing that's for people at the high in income end. Okay, thank you. I just remind council that we're, uh, this is just the her heritage designation on this on this building, so that's, uh, we're not proving any other change. Uh, Councillor Dejanova? I wasn't gonna say anything, but I thought that maybe I'd leave it on a friendly note, uh, that I appreciate the work that our staff have done on this. I appreciate uh, the applicant's explanation. Uh, I live in East Van, I think this is a really cool uh, project uh, and also uh, in the reading about it and really really think that this this just goes to show um, in some of my earlier comments you know what you can do uh, with heritage so I think that that's uh, it, it, it certainly um, it certainly was uh, something that was interesting for me to see um, that being said we haven't had any speakers uh, and I keep an open mind until we um, we debate and decide here so I certainly do support this um, and I think that it's important that we remember that we need people of all incomes in this city because that's how we also uh, get our tax base and without a tax base and without housing for all people, then we can't support those who are sometimes less fortunate. So I think that it's important that we also remember that, you know, Vancouver needs to be a city for 
for everyone, for families, for um, for people who live at shelter rates and the hills limits, but also uh, people who can't afford uh, market rent who uh, inject, uh, uh, you know, uh, new life into our economy, into small business in Vancouver. And uh, I know that that this area is is certainly an area that uh, that has that spirit of local community. So for that reason, I just wanted to say that I really I really do support this, and uh, I'll leave my comments at that. Thanks, Emma. I can just uh, turn the chair over to Councillor Dominato for a second. While I uh, this might make Councillor Swanson feel better, this was uh, Cope's headquarters for a very long time uh, under under Larry Campbell uh, and Think City. So there's a lot of political activity that's happened in that building, and uh, I'm sure there will be more activities. For every, perhaps not so nefarious, but uh, <laughs> but that's where the last Olympics were approved. I think in there. So. <laughs> Who knows what will happen next? Okay, th thanks so much, and now I'll take the chair back if you don't mind. Um, okay, uh, right, so we can call a vote on this one. <laughs> Councillor Carr, Councillor Swanson. Let's wait for Councillor Swanson. Okay, so that's uh, passed with none in opposition. Thank you very much, Council. On to the text amendment for 1500 West Georgia Street. We'll just read the uh, application, summary of correspondence, and then we'll get underway. This is an application by the BOSA Properties Incorporated to amend CD1705 to increase a permitted floor space ratio, FSR, from 10.82 to 10.93, and to increase the maximum floor area of subarea A by 432.2 square meters, equivalent of 4,652.2 square feet, to correct an error in the floor area calculation for the existing retained office building. No correspondence has been received on this application since it was referred to public hearing and prior to the close of the speaker's list and receipt of public comments. This represents all correspondence received up to 5 p.m. today. Thanks very much. We have Michael Naylor here uh, from the Rezoning Center and there's no uh, pre staff presentation for this item, but here to answer questions, I imagine. Um, and I don't think there's an applicant team. Is, there an app is the applicant team here? There is, okay, great. Did you uh, wish to speak to the application or just answer questions? Thank you very much. Okay, so any questions from uh, council to staff or the applicant? I don't see anybody there. We don't have any speakers, I don't think. I don't have any speakers, so I, oh, Councillor Dejanova? I have to, okay. Uh, so I'm gonna make a public call. Um, if anybody in the audience would like to speak to this item, now's your chance. Going twice, third time. Thanks very much. So there's no speakers. The speakers list is now closed and we won't receive any more um, public correspondence because we haven't had any since five and we'll close the list. So any closing comments by the applicant? Nope. Thanks, staff, any closing comments? Nope. Okay. Um, so, uh, Councillor Dejanova, I take it you're going to move the motion? I'm happy to move this, Mr. Mayor, and it, it simply is a text amendment, so there, uh, there isn't very much that I will say to it other than uh, I'm I will be supporting this, and uh, in the interest of keeping it short, that's all I'll say. Okay, thanks. Do you have a Thank seconder? You. Thanks very much. So, uh, does anybody want to speak to this at all? If not, then we'll call a vote. Councillor Weave and Councillor Kirby Young. That's right. That's unanimous. Thanks very much, Council. And uh, now we're on to the next item, rezoning on Clive Avenue. If we can get the uh, clerk to 
Read out the application. This is an application by DYS Architecture to rezone 3235-3261 Clive Avenue from CD1 Comprehensive Development District 219 to new CD1 Comprehensive Development District to permit the development of a six-story residential building fronting Vaness Avenue and three and a half story townhouses fronting Clive Avenue with 68 residential units, 62 strata titled units, and six market rental units, increases to the permitted floor space ratio, FSR, from 1.20 to 2.25, and to the maximum building height from 11.9 meters, equivalent of 39 feet, to 21.4 meters, equivalent of 70.2 feet are proposed. The following correspondence has been received since referral to public hearing and prior to the close of the speaker's list and receipt of public comments. One piece of correspondence in support, one piece of correspondence in, in opposition, and one piece of correspondence dealing with other aspects of the application. This re represents all correspondence received up to 5 p.m. today. Thanks very much. And um, we have uh, Michelle Yip here from the uh, Rezoning Center. Um, but we have no speakers, so we might want to waive, waive the presentation unless that, does anybody want to see the presentation? Okay. I'm happy to waive. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, so we'll waive the presentation of the applicant team here to speak to the applicant team. You don't have to speak, just if you'd like to, you can, or just answer questions. That's great. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any questions from um, council to staff or the applicant? This is your chance to ask the applicant questions. I don't see anybody on the queue. Okay, we have nobody on the uh, formally on the list, so I'll call to the public. Is there anybody who'd like to speak to this uh, rezoning application? Going twice. One last call. Okay, thanks very much. So we're going to, uh, we haven't received any um, correspondence after 5 p.m., so we'll close the receipt of public comments and move on to hearing closing comments. Uh, does the applicant have any closing comments? Closing comments? Okay, nice to hear, thank you. Uh, staff have any closing comments? Nope, thank you. Council have any questions? I got Councillor Dejanova. Uh, question? I do have a question okay. uh, for staff. And it's specifically on the, on looking at the way that this, this project has been structured with affordability. And in the report, I understand that there are townhomes included, which um, meets the policy and several policies in the plan. However, I was wondering if staff could elaborate on what what it would do if if council perhaps were to um, to to put specific um, specific uh, regulations on um, the types of rents that were charged here at this building, if the pro forma would still work and if that would be workable for the applicant in your conversations with the applicant? Uh, I think the applicant should be able to answer that question in terms of their A little late for that. So we've, we've closed, we, we can't hear from the applicant now. So it's just. No, I, was, I asked staff in their conversations with uh, the applicant. Okay, that's and, what the, I and said. the response. So, yes, <laughs> yeah. that's why I said in your conversations with the applicant. My apologies, that's Mr. Okay. Mayor, that I wasn't clear. That's okay. Yeah. Well, it wasn't a conversation that we had. Real Estate has reviewed the performa, um, and there was fairly. Uh, you know, from the understanding that I've had in terms of their negotiations with real estate, it was a fairly tight performa um, in terms of the lift. And there is a CAC being produced on this, um, being achieved on this at 1.2 million, uh, okay. which is, you know. <laughs> okay, so if, um, if, if, uh, so we would, would there be a concern that this would, undermine the family housing that would be built in much needed townhome stock in our city if the the mix of how the affordability of the unit structured was changed yes i believe there would be if there was a a, a you know a, a, if the affordability structure there was an imposition in terms of providing a particular rental rate 
I think there would be um, implications and impacts to the project would, overall. Would that be the same for income? Uh, I believe so. Okay, that's good to know. Um, also had a question on overall, is this one of the more affordable neighborhoods in Vancouver? Would, <laughs> would we, it, it, can staff answer that question? Just on a land economics standpoint, that's what, I, that's what I'm looking at. It's a tough one. Um, you know, when we initially did the Joyce Collinwood plan, it was seen as an area that had a uh, more affordable um, housing stock. Uh, I did a cursory review today, though, of uh, housing prices as well as rental rates, and they are um, quite high as well, um, actually. Comparatively to other areas of Vancouver, would it's, you say it ranks on the lower end of a I would say it's actually the equivalent. Um, it does range. There's a, a huge range in terms of the uh, housing stock in terms of age, and then the age is reflective of certain pricing. So there, there's a large range in terms of the pricing. So I should say a 26-year-old condo in terms of pricing, it was going as low as 460000 to a two-year-old build at 850000 and okay. then the rental rates ranging from 1700 to 2400 Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Swanson. I have an amendment. I don't think this is the time. Right? Yep. Still not quite there yet. We're, we haven't got the uh, motion moved yet, so you'd have to wait for that period. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Dominato. Questions to staff? Yes. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on... Um, page 10 of uh, the report, um, just noticing the initial submission was 100% um, strata units, and then it was revised to, to include um, six units of rental. Um, was that something that was encouraged through our conversations with city staff to achieve more rental stock, or was that something that came forward from the applicant? I'm just curious about sort of that It was something that, that the city had initiated in terms of the conversation through the review of the processing of the application. Um, it was realized that the rental housing stock ODP did apply to this site as a CD1 zone site, and so we had um, altered the application to, to advise the applicant that the one-to-one -one replacement ratio would be required. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, Councilor Nishinova, any more questions? I was happy to move the motion, Mr. Mayor. Okay. The staff recommendations as proposed. Great. Thank you. And seconder? Great. Anything else to say? You've got to move um, on. Sorry, I'm just going to move to the main queue. And I'll just let people load up on the main yeah. queue there. Thanks. Okay. Thanks so much, Mr. Mayor. I'm I'm happy to support this. And I, I remember when uh, the plan was approved here in the previous term of council. Uh, I feel that not only is this uh, an, um, one of the mo more affordable areas in Vancouver to live, but this will provide much needed housing stock, rental housing stock um, in the area. And as well as I, I think that we're going to see, we're going to see different types of housing. Um, they come to us depending on the zoning and the plan. That being said, uh, you know, uh, my any questions that I had were answered very, very well above what I even expected by staff as to the fact that there is a CAC and that has tightened up where we're at with the pro forma. Um, that being said, uh, I also understand that it's it's something that we need to consider um, when we when we look at the different types of housing. And as I just spoke to in a previous motion, we need all different types of housing and that helps us to support our models throughout the city of Vancouver. So for that reason and the fact that there are some townhomes also included and we're seeing less and less of those uh, applications in the city of Vancouver, um, I will be supporting this. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Swanson? Yeah, I sent an amendment um, basically just um, adding another letter further that the Approvals be subject to the CAC revenue from the project being used to increase affordability of social housing for fifty for households with under fifty thousand K in that neighborhood. So it, there's a really good chart on page ten that has what some of the incomes are of people in the neighborhood. The median household income of a renter of a renter household is less than fifty thousand. So half of renters have, have less than 50,000 renter households, and the median income for a single person is 30,000. So there's obviously a 
harsh need for affordable housing for people under 50, and I thought maybe this would be a way to throw some money in and see if we could get it somewhere in the neighborhood at least. Okay, thanks, Councillor Swanson. I'm just going to stop your timer here. I'm going to check. I believe this is out of order, but I am going. I'm going to check with the uh, planners uh, and get right back to you. It just uh, my suspicion is that we can't just change the policy right at the end of, of an application. So I'll, I'll come right back. Okay, uh, Councillor Swanson, uh, after conferring, this, this is in order, and so um, we're uh, fine to uh, move ahead with it if it's seconded. So I don't hear a seconder, so we're going to move on. Councillor Swanson, do you have anything else? Sorry, I'm just checking on the, uh, on the mics. Mic. There we go. Yeah, go ahead. And only... ...be for people at Hills. Only So out of 1,400 units, we get 30 for people at Hills, 30 for people at 50,000 or under. It's not a very good ratio. It's especially not a very good ratio for a neighborhood where the av median... Household income is 50000 and we as a council need to do something about this. So somebody please tell me how. If, if you won't second a motion like this, I don't know what we can do. Uh, on to Councillor Kirby Young. Um, I, was on, I was on previously for a point of order, but um, we've dealt with that. Um, and I do note that we had a uh, previously similar amendment, but I think at the time on a previous hearing it was ruled out of order because I'll just provide this comment from my own perspective uh, because we have an existing CAC policy that allocates how and where CACs are applied. Um, however, I'll speak to the main um, project and I am supportive of this one. I think that it does provide um, some unique housing. I appreciate the fact that the six, there's the combination with the market rental units so that we have replacement of those um, and I think it does provide some residential units um, in an attractive design um, in, a, in a great neighborhood, so I will support it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Domenano? Uh, sorry, it's a holdover for appointment information. Hey, thank you. Councillor Carr? Yes, I, I was um, prepared actually to, um, to comment on the amendment that was um, not seconded, and uh, the reason I, I had an actual, I would have but I had a I had a question about it. Um, nonetheless, we've moved beyond that, and I. If it I makes really everybody wanna... feel better, I, I subsequently have had a note from legal saying it, it isn't in order. <laughs> oh. So I had uh, moved ahead without getting a full legal comment, and now we've got it back. So it was out of order. That's that's good information. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I, uh, but I really feel that that uh, number one, this is a this is a project I've seen lots of over the last 
number of years. Although normally the six-story residential buildings that are strata don't necessarily come with market rentals, so this is a, a rarer form to have some market rental, and I think it's a good idea to introduce um, as much rock market rental as we can. I, I'm under no... Um, um, delusion that it will be in the affordable range. It'll probably be at market rates, um, uh, but uh, but nonetheless, it is a step in the right direction. Um, though I think it's really important for us as a council to really look at, you know, where do CACs go from um, uh, development such as this? So as we go through the public hearing process, and normally when a development occurs within a neighborhood that has any kind of a plan that has a public benefit strategy, it's a public benefit strategy associated with that local area plan that directs where the CACs go. That's a public process. That's where people have been involved over sometimes many years in terms of determining those priorities. Um, so, uh, you know, I am hesitant to, um, to redirect money that's not in line with what the residents have already determined are their priorities for their particular area. Notwithstanding that, I see the point that, um, and I'm, I'm compassionate around the point that is raised by Councillor Swanson in terms of real affordability and uh, the way in which I believe we need to move forward on that is with our Housing Vancouver strategy. And, uh, and there are, is an opportunity this fall to really take a look, and we've asked staff to take a look at um, those figures being more clearly matched to the real needs of different income levels um, within the city um, that was done at the rental housing and incentives review in the fall. So I, I, I'm hopeful that we actually will get some different um, targets out of that kind of process. Thanks very much, Councillor Ajanova. I was just going to wrap up to say that um, I too was going to call a point of order because I wasn't sure if CACs could be used on operational expenses like rents which I understood that to be the deepening of affordability, but we don't need to worry about that anymore. Um, I too, and that's what I mentioned um, to Councillor Carr's point, uh, the community spoke very clearly about what they wanted. This was a unique plan, and now we're seeing projects come from that plan where the CACs are being allocated as per the community's wishes. And I think that, that that's certainly something we've heard loud and clear from the community. Uh, that being said, as I said, uh, we need all different types of housing in the city of Vancouver. And I think it's incumbent upon us to try our very best to, to make sure that uh, we're doing what we can, not only for market rental, but uh, for housing at the, the hills limits, for housing um, in our MERP projects, for or that meet the guidelines of our MERP um, that the ones that meet our short program, um, as well as uh, those that that are partnered with uh, uh, levels of government and nonprofit organizations. That being said, uh, family housing in the city is something that we are hearing that there is not enough of, uh, market or below market family housing, um, especially in, in neighborhoods uh, such as this, where there are amenities uh, like schools and uh, coffee shops. And I think that it's, it's really important that we, we consider that um, among the spectrum of affordability, also in looking at our tax base and how we fund our budget here at the City of Vancouver. So for that reason, I, again, will just state that I wholeheartedly support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wade. Um, yeah, I'm supportive. We are, 1.2 million is a quite a smaller CAC than some of the other projects. I know we're getting rental out of this project, but I think we need to kind of justify, are we getting a small amount of rental or a larger CAC that we could put into more affordability and affordable rental projects in the area? So um, for me, it's, it's a bit of a balance looking at some of the projects and trying to really quantify the value of the rental we're getting um, to what some of the other benefits would be to the neighbor. Um, so that's been a bit of a balance for me on this project. However, I do think close to the SkyTrain, the form of the building, um, I think there were some good comments and changes by the applicant, so I will be supportive of it. But I do want us to kind of look at what levers we're using to make sure we're delivering the best benefits for the neighborhood. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, that's it for... Um 
looks like questions. Uh, just before we move to the vote, I, I, there have been a whole bunch of amendments that have come forward this evening in other meeting, uh, uh, meetings, and they do seem to come kind of on the fly, and I'm wondering if I can work with staff to come up with a process that if you have amendments that we can check and see if they're in order. So I will check back with the city manager and planning team about, uh, but but there would be, have to be some advanced submission to make that work, so I will come back with council with some suggestions as to how, how that might move ahead. With that in mind, though, uh, we'll call a vote on this one. And that's passed with Councillor Swanson in opposition. Okay, on to the last uh, one of the evening, we have uh, rezoning on Canby Street. I have the clerk read the application, that'd be great. This is an application by Arno Mattis Architecture Limited to rezone 4338-4362 Canby Street from RS1 One Family Dwelling District to CD1 Comprehensive Development District to permit the development of a six-story residential building with 68 strata units, sorry, 68 strata residential units, including townhouses at the lane increases to the permitted floor space ratio, FSR from 0.70 to 2.75 and to the maximum building height from 10.7 meters equivalent of 35 feet to 20.5 meters equivalent of 67 feet are proposed. The following correspondence has been received since referral to public hearing and prior to the close of the speaker's list and receipt of public comments. One piece of correspondence in opposition. This represents all correspondence received up to 5 p.m. today. Thanks very much. We have Tess Monroe here from the uh, Rezoning Center, and uh, there are no speakers. So, just wondering, just wondering if anybody would want to hear the presentation. Again, I usually, if one person wants to see it, then I usually let it go ahead. But I don't see anybody nodding, so we'll wait the presentation. Thank you very much. Is the applicant team here? Great. Would you like to speak to this? Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so there, I have Councillor Dejanova on for questions. Okay, thanks. Um, right, so uh, we don't have anybody on the list and we have no questions, so I'm going to ask uh, if there are anybody here that would like to speak to this, anybody from the public or in the gallery. Going once, I'll make a second call, and one more time. Last call, so there are uh, no speakers. The speakers list is now closed. And uh, we've had few or no public comments after 5 p.m. today, so we'll close the receipt of public comments and move on to hear closing comments and ask further questions. So does the applicant have any closing comments at all? Nope, great, thanks, staff. Nope. Okay, thanks. Uh, council, have any questions? I don't see any. Oh, I do see one. Councillor Dejanova, or Councillor Weeb, do you have? Yeah, to staff, the two trees that are being reten re retained, the two larger ones, how is that in the discussion with the proponent to ensure that those trees will survive and the roots and everything else? Because it's pretty, it's amazing how the building's been structured around. I really appreciate the architect finding ways to kind of protect those two large trees. But I'm just wondering, what do we do to ensure the life of those trees will be long living? So they're included as a condition uh, in the report. As part of that, the applicant did submit an arborist report and tree retention strategy as part of their um, application. Um, that will be reviewed again at the development permit stage to make sure that their tree retention strategy is continuing through the process. Um, and then uh, subsequent permits will be issued according to that. Okay, and we're seeing a lot of amenity spaces on the roof, is that? staff kind of recognizing is kind of a directive that we're looking proponents to come forward or is that more the proponents coming forward looking for that outdoor kind of shared space on Yes, yeah, so as part of phase three of the Canby plan, um, it was allowed for a partial amenity, um, indoor amenity room to be located on the roof, uh, co-located with outdoor amenity space. And that was in response to um, uh, increased livability of these family units um, in, in high-rise developments. Um, so we're encouraging that, especially when it's a concrete um, building form that uh, also has access already to the roof. Um, this was providing access to the roof in an outdoor amenity, so it was a good spot to consider that location um, for an indoor amenity at the same time. 
Okay, thank you. Great, thanks so much, uh, Councillor Deschanova. I was happy to move the motion, seeing okay. no one else on the queue. Okay, thanks. Um, wanted to to say that I, I understand that the uh, phase three of the Canby plan uh, did make some some specific um, policy or does include specific policy that allows for um, unique features that other spaces might not um, in other um, area plans and district schedules. That being said, um, I'm satisfied that this not only will provide housing, family housing, and townhouses at the lane, which I, I think we we see some of those on Canby Street already, and I think that it's really important that we we look at that in a way to maximize space and family family living opportunities. So for that reason, um, and hearing and, and understanding that that does fit within our uh, housing Vancouver strategy. Uh, that being said, there may be some comments about them being strata residential units. That doesn't necessarily mean that, th that these units won't house renters. And I wanted to make that very clear as well, because we often see strata units uh, housing renters, and they also contribute to the rental market in Vancouver. So for that reason, and uh, the fact that this uh, conforms to and meets all of the uh, um, in the policy report, clearly states that it meets several policies, uh, including uh, the Canby uh, Phase Three plan. I am supportive of this project. Thank you. Thanks so much, Councillor Swanson. So I had my amendment ready, but I'm sure it will be ruled out of order. I just wanted to again raise the issue of affordability. I'm looking at the benefit plan here for the Canby corridor. There's over 10,000 units of housing planned. Less than 10% of them are social housing. Of those, less than 10% or only 30% would be at Hills. The median household income for renters is 50,000. And there's about $6 million of benefits here that could do a lot towards increasing affordability, but won't. And I think we have to get a huge handle on this so that we are in fact building the right supply. I also want to say that in my pre-council days, I was a member of the Downtown East Side Local Area Plan, and the Downtown East Side has a public benefits plan. And I can assure you that the community did not agree on that public benefit plan. I don't think we even saw it. It may have been passed by council, but I don't think the argument that the community wants is, is necessarily something that is true. Um, so I'm going to vote against this because there's nothing in it that's affordable. We've spent the whole night approving things that aren't affordable to people under 50000 and I don't think that's right. Thanks. Councillor Weep. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank the proponent. I think that it's a beautiful design. I think you've challenged the norm, and I think that it's kind of needed on the corridor where we see in a lot of buildings of similar design. So I really appreciate um, that you're kind of breaking the the kind of normal mold that we see in the buildings up there and the way you've kind of moved the building around to deal with the natural space. So I will be supportive. Thanks very much. Councillor DeGenova? I was actually going to comment on the design and say that I think it's courageous design. And and in my own opinion, um, I, as Councillor Weebick explained, I think it will be uh, a welcomed addition to the Canby Corridor. That being said, I did want to say that um, every 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 housing unit that we build contributes to the right supply. Every housing unit that we at the city enable to be built, is what I meant to say, uh, contributes to the right supply because people who perhaps are overhoused as renters uh, who may be able to um, purchase housing if we do build the right supply. I think that we we have to consider the fact that our staff are are very well aware and understand our housing um, our housing Vancouver strategy and they keep that in mind in all of the policies that this conforms to and meets and the recommendations that they bring to us. And to the point that this uh, this doesn't fit in rental housing, it's no different than uh, the comments I made before. We can't deal with every 
every single item in one item at public hearing. It's a quasi-judicial body. We have to consider what's in front of us. And I, I think that it is incumbent on us uh, to remember that and, and to acknowledge that this does meet the policy. And I, I wanted to state that again just in my, in my closing to this. Thank you. Thanks so much, Councillor Kirby Young. Thank you. I'll be brief. Um, I, I, I do support this project, and uh, in terms of the positives, there was one line that struck me in here, and, and I was sort of taken by the design. It says, the modernism building design is conceived as an homage to the stratigraphic rock formations at Queen Elizabeth Park. Um, and I, that really stood out for me, and I really appreciate the context and the attention paid um, to the surrounding area. Um, and I do think, though, that I, I really share Councillor Swanson's concerns around the dire need for lower level housing or uh, in terms of income um, and the diversity of housing. But we do have approximately 630,000 odd people in the city who all need to live somewhere and we need multiple types of housing. And so while we want to need to pay attention to the 2,223 homeless folks and the ones that need housing at, at sort of the more modest income levels, not everybody can afford a home um, or a single family home that people that are buying. And it, we can't punish other people by not putting other housing types and in stream into the into the market. And so I, I do think that it's a really important conversation, but it's separate from what we're being asked to approve here. Um, and $4.4 .4 million of a community amenity contribution is significant, and that will provide, contribute to livability and some of the other goals that we have in the city. So um, we have to consider that in context, and constraining our housing supply I don't think is the means to achieve the other very important goals that um, council aspires to do and to really provide housing for those folks that truly need it. So um, all of that said, I think the design is innovative. Um, it takes the um, context of the area into consideration and it's nice to see the, the juxtaposition with the townhouses animating the lane as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, looks like it on the queue, so I'll call the vote. Councillor Boyle and Councillor Kirby. Councillor Boyle. You can get a vote assist if you like. In favor. Okay. Thanks so much. That's passed with Councillor Swanson in opposition. Thank you so much, Council. That is it for this evening. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Thank you. Seconder. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? Great. Thanks so much, Council. Look at that. Eight, not even 8.30. And remember, we're not back here on Thursday night. So enjoy that night off. I, I thought it was I thought it was a public hearing reserve. Okay. Well, that puts the pressure on for tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. See you tomorrow.